Hello, good evening and welcome and thank you for your company this evening as you've tuned in to another episode from me. Bee! So I hope you've all had a good week again. Uh, it's been a bit of a weird week here. I think spring is finally here though. Anyway, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and comment on this video. And this video is Unsolved Cases Part 2. John David Gosh was a paper boy in West Des Moines, Iowa, who disappeared between 6 and 7 a.m. on September the 5th, 1982. He is presumed to have been kidnapped. As of 2023, there have been no arrests made and the case is now considered cold, but remains open. On Sunday, September the 5th, 1982, in the suburb of West Des Moines, Johnny Gosh left home before dawn to begin his paper route. Although it was customary for Johnny to awaken his father to help with the route, the boy took only the family's miniature dachshund, Gretchen, with him that morning. Other paper carriers for the Des Moines Register would later report having seen Gosh at the paper drop, picking up his newspapers. It was the last sighting of Gosh that can be corroborated by multiple witnesses. Another paper boy named Mike reported that he observed Gosh talking to a stocky man in a Bluetooth-toned car near the paper drop. Another witness, John Rossi, saw the man in the blue car talking to Gosh and thought something was strange. Gosh told Rossi that the man was asking for directions and asked Rossi to help. Rossi looked at the licence plate but could not recall the plate number. He said, I keep hoping I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see that number on the licence plate as distinctly as night and day, but that hasn't happened. Rossi underwent hypnosis and told police some of the numbers, and that plate was from Warren County, Iowa. According to a private investigator hired by the Goshers, as Johnny walked to Block North, where his route started, a paperboy noticed another man following Gosh. A neighbour heard a door slam and saw a silver Ford Fairmont speed away northwards from where Johnny's wagon was found. John and Noreen Gosh, Johnny's parents, began receiving phone calls from customers along their son's route, complaining of undelivered papers. John performed a cursory search of the neighbourhood around 6am. He immediately found Johnny's wagon full of newspapers, two blocks from their home. The Goshers immediately contacted the West Des Moines Police Department and reported Johnny's disappearance. Noreen, in her public statements and her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, has been critical of what she perceives as a slow reaction time from authorities, and of the policy at the time that Gosh could not be classified as a missing person until 72 hours had passed. By her estimation, the police did not arrive to take her report for a full 45 minutes. Initially, the police came to believe that Gosh was a runaway, but later they changed their statement and suggested that Gosh was kidnapped but they were unable to establish a viable motive. They turned up little evidence and arrested no suspects in connection with the case. A few months after his September 1982 disappearance, Noreen Gosh has said her son was spotted in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when a boy yelled to a woman for help before being dragged off by two men. Over the years, several private investigators have assisted the Goshes with their search for their son. Among them are Jim Rothstein, a retired New York City police detective, and Ted Gunderson, a retired chief of Los Angeles branch. In 1984, Gosh's photograph appeared alongside that of Juanita Lee Estevez on milk cartons across America. They were the second and third abducted children to have their plights publicised in this way. The first was Eaton Pats. On August 12, 1984, Eugene Martin, another Des Moines area paper boy, disappeared under similar circumstances. He disappeared while delivering newspapers on the south side of Des Moines. Mark James Warren Allen, then 13 years old, told his mother he was going to walk to a friend's house across the street on March 29, 1986, the day before Easter. However, he never made it to the neighbour's house and hasn't been seen since. Allen was first believed to be the third Iowa paper boy to go missing in the 1980s based on earlier media reporting. Alan was not a paperboy in Des Moines, according to a detailed piece about how he was missing people that appeared in the Des Moines Register on August 18, 2013. Even now, 
Three decades later, none of the three boys' cases have been solved. Authorities were unable to prove a connection between the three cases, yet Noreen Gosch says she was personally informed of the abduction of Eugene Martin a few months in advance by a private investigator who was searching for her son. She was told the kidnapping would take place the second weekend in August 1984 and it would be a paper boy from the south side of Des Moines. In 1985, Noreen Gosch received a letter from Robert Herman Mayer the second, 19, of Saginaw, Michigan. The letter had been signed Samuel Forbes, Dakota. In the letter, Mayer stated that he was a guard in a motorcycle club when Gosch's son disappeared in September 1982. According to Mayer, Gosch's son was taken as part of a large child slavery ring operated by the club. According to the FBI, Mayer requested from and received $11,000 from the Gosches. Mayer additionally requested $100,000 more along with a promise to return their son. Mayer was arrested in Buffalo at the Canadian border by FBI agents and was later charged with fraud by wire. The letter Mayer wrote had stated that Gosh's son was sold to a man who Mayer identified as a high-level drug dealer residing in Mexico City. Despite the accusation of fraud, Noreen Gosh reportedly believed Mayer at his word and later criticised the FBI, stating the arrest warrant against Mayer destroyed her and her husband John's credibility with anyone who would take the couple's offer to pay ransom for their boy. According to Noreen Gosh, one morning in March 1997, she was awakened around 2.30am by a knock at her apartment door. Waiting outside was Johnny Gosh, now 27, accompanied by an unidentified man. Gosh said she immediately recognised her son, who opened his shirt to reveal a birthmark on his chest. We talked about an hour or an hour and a half. He was with another man, but I have no idea who that person was. Johnny would look over to the other person for approval to speak, says Gosh. He didn't say where he's living or where he was going. In a 2005 interview, Gosh said, The night that he came here, he was wearing jeans and a shirt and had a coat on because it was March. It was cold and his hair was long. It was shoulder length and it was straight and dyed black. After the visit, she had the FBI create a picture she says looked like Johnny. Gosh self-published a book in 2000, titled Why Johnny Can't Come Home. The book presents her understanding of what her son went through, based on the original research of various private investigators and her son's visit. On September 1st, 2006, Gosh reported that she found photographs left at her front door, some of which she posted on her website. One colour photo shows three boys bound and gagged. She says that a black and white photo appears to show 12-year-old Johnny Gosh with his mouth gagged and his hands and feet tied, and an apparent human brand on his shoulder. A third photo shows a man, possibly dead, who may have something tied round his neck. Noreen Gosh stated that the man was one of the perpetrators who molested my son. Gosh later said the first two photos had originated on a website featuring child pornography. On September the 13th, an anonymous letter was mailed to Des Moines Police. Gentlemen, someone has played a reprehensible joke on a grieving mother. The photo in question is not one of her son, but of three boys in Tampa, Florida, about 1979-80, to 80, challenging each other to an escape contest. There was an investigation concerning that picture, made by the Hillsborough County, Florida, Sheriff's Office. No charges were filed and no wrongdoing established. The lead detective on the case was named Zalva. This allegation should be easy enough to check out. Nelson Zalva, who worked for the Hillsborough County, Florida Sheriff's Office in the 1970s, said the details of the letter were true, and adds that he also investigated the black and white in 1978 or 1979, before Gosh's disappearance. I interviewed the kids and they said there was no coercion or touching. I could never prove a crime, Zalva says. When asked for proof that this was indeed the same photo from the investigation nearly three decades prior, Zalva could not provide any. According to the documentary film Who Took Johnny, 2014, only three boys in the picture were identified by law enforcement, but not the one thought to be Johnny. Noreen Gosh still believes the pictures to be of her son. In 1989, 21-year-old Paul A. Bonacci 
told his attorney, John DeCamp, that he had been abducted into a sex ring with Gosh as a teenager and was forced to participate in Gosh's kidnapping. John DeCamp met with Bonacci and believes he was telling the truth. Noreen later met him and said he told her things he could know only from talking with her son. He said that Johnny had a birthmark on his chest, a scar on his tongue and a burn scar on his lower leg. Although a description of the birthmark had been widely circulated, information about the scars had not been made public. Bonacci also described a stammer that Johnny had when he was upset. The FBI and local police do not believe that Bonacci is a credible witness in the case and have not interviewed him. His siblings told police he was at home when Gosh was abducted. The case generated national interest, as Noreen Gosh became increasingly vocal about the inadequacy of law enforcement's investigation of missing children cases. She established the Johnny Gosh Foundation in 1982, through which she visited schools and spoke at seminars about the modus operandi of sexual predators. She lobbied for the Johnny Gosh Bill state legislation, which would mandate an immediate police response to reports of missing children. The bill became law in Iowa in 1984, and similar or identical laws were later passed in Missouri and seven other states. In August 1984, Noreen Gosch testified in Senate hearings on organised crime, speaking about organised paedophilia and its presumed role in her son's abduction. She began receiving death threats. Gosch also testified before the US Department of Justice which provided $10 million to establish the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. Gosh was invited to the White House by President Ronald Reagan for the dedication ceremony. The spate of missing children ignited a panic over childhood safety in the United States. The America ethos of letting pre-teens roam freely through neighbourhood streets on foot or on bicycles faded. Ron Sampson, who became head of the Help Find Johnny Gosh Foundation in 1983, said... Johnny's disappearance absolutely changed the culture. You didn't let your kids out of your sight, Samson said. All of a sudden, everything that you thought was safe and sound was suspect. Born on the 12th of May 1981 in Asheville, North Carolina, Zeb Wayne Quinn had admirable dreams and the ambitious character to achieve them. He was described as kind and caring by his family, and he was enrolled in the Reserve Officers Training Corps, determined to join the armed forces as a commissioned officer. Until then, Quinn was working at Walmart to save money for a new car. Owens, his 22-year-old co-worker, told him that he knew of a car for sale not too far away. After his shift in the electronics department, Quinn met Owens in the Walmart car park. They each drove their own car and they were spotted together at a nearby convenience store, purchasing sodas at 9.15pm. Then Quinn vanished. His mother, Denise Flarkis, reported him missing the following day. According to the Asheville Citizen Times, when Quinn's car was found in the parking lot of Little Pig's Barbecue on the 6th of January, things started to get strange. The car's headlights were on, Drawings of a mouth and an exclamation mark were scrawled on the back window in lipstick, and there was a live puppy inside. In addition to the tiny black Labrador, which one of the officers on the case adopted, police found several drink bottles, a jacket that wasn't Quinn's, and a keycard from an unknown hotel in the Mazda. Investigators were also tipped off that witnesses had seen a mysterious woman driving the car around. After police put together a composite image of the driver based on witness reports, they noted she bore a shocking resemblance to a woman named Misty Taylor. Quinn had supposedly been romantically pursuing Taylor before his disappearance, but she had an allegedly abusive boyfriend named Wesley Smith. These were only the first of the baffling clues the police have spent years trying to unravel. Since Owens was the last person to be seen with Quinn, police were keen to question him. He claimed that just after they left the convenience store at 9.15pm, Quinn used his headlights to signal for Owens to pull over. When he did, Quinn told him he'd received an urgent page and desperately needed to return the call. Owens said Quinn was visibly frantic after he made the call from a nearby payphone. He apologised for cancelling their plans and sped off. 
Owens also claimed that Quinn rear-ended him in his hurry to leave. Most curious of all, however, was that Owens admitted himself into hospital just hours later for a head injury and several fractured ribs that he said he'd sustained in another car crash that night. Police never found a collision report or evidence of this second accident. Investigators did discover that on January the 4th, someone claiming to be Quinn had called out sick from Walmart. Quinn's supervisor Patty King answered the phone and realised the voice on the other end sounded nothing like Quinn's. When King called the number back, she was connected to the local Volvo plant, where Owens worked a second job. Police questioned Owens about it and he admitted to making the call, but he said Quinn had asked him to do so. Quinn's family didn't believe a word. Owens told Spin magazine in 2001, They called me at work like, What do you do to him? But I tried to be nice. They want to know. But until they find him alive or find him dead, or prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that I didn't do anything, people are always going to think I had something to do with it. With no solid evidence against Owens, police turned to the call made to Zeb Quinn's pager the night he disappeared. After tracing the page that supposedly sent Quinn into a frenzy before he vanished, police discovered the call came from the house of his aunt, Ina Ustish. However, Ustish denied making the call. After all, she'd been having dinner with her close friend, Tamara Taylor, the mother of Misty Taylor. According to Spin magazine, Quinn had met 19-year-old Taylor at his family's restaurant just weeks before he disappeared, and the two struck up a friendship. When he learned about Taylor's reportedly abusive relationship with Smith, he wanted to help her. One of Quinn's friends later recalled that's all he talked about was this girl. However, when word got back to Smith that Quinn and his girlfriend were talking, he allegedly began making threats. A friend of Quinn's father told Spin, Quinn and this guy had some confrontation, and that's when a threat got back to Zeb. What Wesley and some of his buddies might do. They were threatening Zeb to stay away from the young lady. Ustish told police that Taylor and Smith were both present at Tamra Taylor's home on the night of January the 2nd. But if his aunt was out of the house, how did Quinn receive a call from her phone? To make things even more confusing for police, Ustish reported that her house had been broken into that night. Nothing had been stolen, but various items were out of place. Taylor and Smith denied being involved in Quinn's disappearance, and since there was no solid evidence to connect them to the potential crime either, the investigation came to a dead end. A break in the case didn't come until 15 years later. On March the 17th, 2015, Robert Jason Owens was arrested for the murder of Food Network star contestant Christy Show and Cod, her husband and their unborn child. He later pled guilty to three counts of second-degree murder and two counts of dismembering human remains. According to the Asheville Citizen Times, soon after Owens' arrest, police obtained a warrant to search his property in connection to Zeb Quinn's disappearance. They'd received a tip about a fish pond project that Owens had started and aborted. Beneath the concrete of the abandoned pond, police said they found fabric, leather materials and unknown hard fragments, as well as several plastic bags filled with possibly pulverised lime or powdered mortar mix. With the new evidence in hand, a grand jury charged Owens with first-degree murder for the death of Zeb Quinn on July 10, 2017. While investigators are glad to have finally made an arrest in the case, they are still far from solving the twists, turns and bizarre clues surrounding Quinn's mysterious disappearance. On December 1, 1948, at 6.30am, the police were contacted after the body of a man was discovered on Somerton Park Beach near Glen Elg, about seven miles southwest of Adelaide, South Australia. The man was found lying in the sand across from the crippled children's home, which was on the corner of the Esplanade and Bickford Terrace. He was lying back with his head resting against the sea wall, with his legs extended and his feet crossed. It was believed the man had died while sleeping. An unlit cigarette was on the right collar of his coat. A search of his pockets revealed an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach. A bus ticket from the city that may not have been used. 
a narrow aluminium comb that had been manufactured in the USA, a half empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an army club cigarette packet which contained seven cigarettes of a different brand, Ken Cetas, and a quarter full box of Bryant and May matches. Witnesses who came forward said that on the evening of the 30th of November, They'd seen an individual resembling the dead man lying on his back in the same spot where the corpse was later found. A couple who saw him at around 7pm noted that they saw him extend his right arm to its fullest extent, then drop it limply. Another couple who saw him from 7.30pm to 8pm, during which time the streetlights had come on, recounted that they did not see him move during the half hour in which he was in view, although they did have the impression that his position had changed. Although they commented between themselves that it was odd that he was not reacting to the mosquitoes, they had thought it more likely that he was drunk or asleep, and thus did not investigate further. One of the witnesses told the police she observed a man looking down at the sleeping man from the top of the steps that led to the beach. Witnesses say the body was in the same position when the police viewed it. Another witness came forward in 1959 and reported to the police that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along Somerton Park Beach the night before the body was found. A police report was made by Detective Don O'Doherty. According to the pathologist John Burton Cleland, the man was of Britisher appearance and thought to be aged between 40 and 45. He was in top physical condition. He was 5 foot 11 tall with grey eyes, fair to ginger coloured hair, slightly grey around the temples with broad shoulders and narrow waist, hands and nails that showed no sign of manual labour, big and little toes that met in a wedge shape, like those of a dancer, or someone who wore boots with pointed toes, and pronounced high calf muscles, consistent with people who regularly wore boots or shoes with high heels or performed ballet. He was dressed in a white shirt, a red, white and blue tie, brown trousers, socks and shoes, a brown knitted pullover and fashionable grey and brown double-breasted jacket of reportedly American tailoring. All the labels on his clothes had been removed and he had no hat, which was unusual for 1948, or a wallet. He was clean-shaven and carried no identification, which led police to believe he had committed suicide. Finally, his dental records were not able to be matched to any known person. An autopsy was conducted and the pathologist estimated the time of death at around 2am on the 1st of December. The heart was of normal size and normal in every way. Small vessels not commonly observed in the brain were easily discernible with congestion. There was congestion of the pharynx and the gullet was covered with whitening of superficial layers of the mucosa with a patch of ulceration in the middle of it. The stomach was deeply congested. There was congestion in the second half of the duodenum there was blood mixed with the food in the stomach. Both kidneys were congested and the liver contained a great excess of blood in its vessels. The spleen was strikingly large, about three times normal size. There was destruction of the centre of the liver lobules, revealed under the microscope. Acute gastritis haemorrhage, extensive congestion of the liver and spleen and congestion to the brain. Other than that, the coroner was unable to reach a conclusion as to the man's identity, cause of death, or whether the man seen alive at Somerton Beach on the evening of the 30th of November was the same man, as nobody had seen his face at the time. The body was then embalmed on the 10th of December 1948, after the police were unable to get a positive identification. The police said this was the first time they knew that such action was needed. On January the 14th, 1949, Staff at the Adelaide Railway Station discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed, which had been checked into the station cloakroom after 11am on the 30th of November 1948. It was believed that the suitcase was owned by the man found on the beach. In the case were a red check dressing gown, a size 7 red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pyjamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc thought to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and scissors, and a stenciling brush as used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. 
Also in the suitcase was a thread card of Barber brand orange wax thread of an unusual type, not available in Australia. It was the same as that used to repair the lining in a pocket of the trousers the dead man was wearing. All identification marks on the clothes had been removed, but police found the name T. Keen on a tie, Keen on a laundry bag and Keen on a singlet along with three dry cleaning marks. Police believe that whoever removed the clothing tags either overlooked these three items or purposely left the Keen tags on the clothes, knowing Keen was not the dead man's name. With wartime rationing still enforced, clothing was difficult to acquire at that time. Although it was very common practice to use name tags, it was also common when buying second-hand clothing to remove the tags of the previous owners. What was unusual was that there were no spare socks found in the case, and no correspondence, although the police found pencils and unused letter stationery. A search concluded that no T. Keen was missing in any English-speaking country. A nationwide circulation of the dry cleaning marks also proved fruitless. All that could be garnered from the suitcase was that the front gusset and feather stitching on a coat found in the case indicated it had been manufactured in the United States. The coat had not been imported, indicating the man had been to America or bought it from someone of similar size who had been. Police checked incoming train records and believed the man had arrived at Adelaide Railway Station by overnight train from either Melbourne, Sydney or Port Augusta. They speculated that he had showered and shaved at the adjacent city baths, although there was no bath ticket on his body, before returning to the railway station to purchase a ticket for the 10.50am train to Henley Beach, which for whatever reason he did not board. He immediately checked his suitcase at the station cloakroom before leaving the station and catching a city bus to Glenelg. Although named city baths, the centre was not a public bathing facility, but rather a public swimming pool. The railway station bathing facilities were adjacent to the station cloakroom, which itself was adjacent to the station's southern exit onto North Terrace. The city baths on King William Street were accessed from the station's northern exit via a laneway. There is no record of the station's bathroom facilities being unavailable on the day he arrived. An inquest into the man's death, conducted by coroner Thomas Erskine Cleland, commenced a few days following the discovery of the body, but was adjourned until the 17th of June 1949. Cleland, as the investigating pathologist, re-examined the body and made a number of discoveries. He noted that the man's shoes were remarkably clean and appeared to have been recently polished, rather than in the condition expected of a man who had apparently been wandering round Glenelg all day. He added that this evidence fitted in with the theory that the body may have been brought to Somerton Park Beach after the man's death, accounting for the lack of evidence of vomiting and convulsions, which are the two main physiological reactions to poison. Cleland speculated that as none of the witnesses could positively identify the man they saw the previous night as the same person discovered the next morning, there remained the possibility that the man died elsewhere and had been dumped. He stressed that this was purely speculation, as all the witnesses believed it was definitely the same person, as the body was in the same place and lying in the same distinctive position. He also found no evidence indicating the identity of the deceased. Cedric Stanton Hicks Professor of Physiology and Pharmacology at the University of Adelaide testified that a group of drugs, variant of a drug in that group he called number one, and in particular number two, were extremely toxic in a relatively small oral dose that would be extremely difficult if not impossible to identify, even if it had been suspected in the first instance. He gave Cleland a piece of paper with the names of the two drugs, which was entered as Exhibit C18. The names were not released to the public until the 1980s, as at that time they were quite easily procurable by the ordinary individual from a chemist without the need to give a reason for the purchase. The drugs were later publicly identified as Digitalis and Uabane, both cardinalide type cardiac glycosides. Hicks noted that the only fact not found in relation to the body was evidence of vomiting. He then stated its absence was not unknown, but he could not make a frank conclusion without it. Hicks stated that if death had occurred seven hours after the man was last seen to move, it would imply a massive dose that could still have been undetectable. It was noted that the movement seen by witnesses at 7pm could have been the last convulsion preceding death. 
Early in the inquiry, Cleland stated, I would be prepared to find that he died from poison, that the poison was probably a glucoside, and that it was not accidentally administered, but I cannot say whether it was administered by the deceased himself or by some other person. Despite these findings, he could not determine the cause of death of the unidentified man. Cleland remarked that if the body had been carried to its final resting place, then all the difficulties would disappear. Around the same time as the inquest, a tiny piece of rolled up paper with the words Tamam Shud printed on it was found in a fob pocket sewn within the dead man's trouser pocket. Public library officials called in to translate the text identified it as a phrase meaning ended or finished, found on the last page of the Ruby app of Omar Khayyam. The paper's verso side was blank. Police conducted an Australia-wide search to find a copy of the book that had similarly blank verso. A photograph of the scrap of paper was released to the press. Following a public appeal by police, the copy of the Ruby app from which the page had been torn, was located. A man showed police a 1941 edition of Edward Fitzgerald's 1859 translation of Rubiat, published by Wickham and Tombs in Christchurch, New Zealand. Detective Sergeant Lionel Lean, who led the investigation, often protected the privacy of witnesses in public statements by using pseudonyms. Lean referred to the man who found the book by the pseudonym Ronald Francis, and he has never been officially identified. Francis had not considered that the book might be connected to the case until he had seen an article in the previous day's newspaper. There is some uncertainty about the circumstances under which the book was found. One newspaper article refers to the book being found about a week or two before the body was found. Former South Australian police detective Jerry Feltus, who dealt with the matter as a cold case, reports that the book was found just after that man was found on the beach at Somerton. The timing is significant as the man is presumed, based on the suitcase, to have arrived in Adelaide the day before he was found on the beach. If the book was found one or two weeks before, it suggests that the man had visited previously or had been in Adelaide for a longer period. The theme of Rubia is that one should live life to the fullest and have no regrets when it ends. The poem's subject led police to theorise that the man had committed suicide by poison although no other evidence corroborated the theory. The book was missing the words, Tamam Shud, on the last page, which had a blank reverse, and microscopic tests indicated that the piece of paper was from the page torn from the book. In the back of the book were faint indentations representing five lines of text in capital letters. The second line has been struck out, a fact considered significant due to its similarities to the fourth line, and the possibility that it represents an error in encryption. In the book it is unclear whether the first line begins with an M or a W, but it is widely believed to be the letter W, owing to the distinctive difference when compared to the stricken letter M. There appears to be a deleted or underlined line of text that reads M-L-I-A-O-I. Although the last character in this line of text looks like an L, it is fairly clear on closer inspection of the image that it is formed from an I and the extension of the line used to delete or underline that line of text. Also, the other L has a curve to the bottom part of the character. There is also an X above the last O in the code and it is not known if this is significant to the code or not. A telephone number was also found in the back of the book belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen, Joe Thompson born Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb of Marrickville, New South Wales. She lived in Mosley Street, Glenelg, about 1300 foot north of the location where the body was found. When she was interviewed by police, Thompson said that she did not know the dead man or why he would have her phone number and choose to visit her suburb on the night of his death. However, she also reported that at some time late in 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and asked her next door neighbour about her. In his book on the case, Jerry Feltus stated that when he interviewed Thompson in 2002, he found that she was either being evasive or she just did not wish to talk about it. Feltus believed Thompson knew the Somerton man's identity. Thompson's daughter Kate, in a television interview in 2014 with Channel 9's 60 Minutes, also said that she believed her mother knew the dead man. In 1949, 
Jessica Thompson requested that police not keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to third parties, as it would be embarrassing and harmful to her reputation to be linked to such a case. The police agreed, a decision that hampered later investigations. In news media, books and other discussions of the case, Thompson was frequently referred to by various pseudonyms, including the nickname Jestin, and names such as Teresa Johnson Nee Powell. Feltus in 2010 claimed he was given permission by Thompson's family to disclose her names and that of her husband, Prosper Thompson. When she was shown the plaster cast bust of the dead man by D.S. Lean, Thompson said she could not identify the person depicted. According to Lean, he described her reaction upon seeing the cast as completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance she was about to faint. In an interview many years later with Paul Lawson, the technician who made the cast and was present when Thompson viewed it, noted that after looking at the bust, she immediately looked away and would not look at it again. Thompson also said that while she was working at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of Rubiat. In 1945 at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney, she had given it to an Australian Army Lieutenant named Alf Boxall, who was serving at the time in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. Thompson told police that after the war ended, she had moved to Melbourne and married. She said that she had received a letter from Boxall and had replied, telling them that she was now married. Subsequent research suggests that her future husband, Prosper Thompson, was in the process of obtaining a divorce from his first wife in 1949 and that he did not marry Jessica until mid-1950. There is no evidence that Boxall had any contact with Jessica Thompson after 1945. As a result of their conversations with Thompson, police suspected that Boxall was the dead man. However, in July 1949, Boxall was found in Sydney and the final page of his copy of Rubiat, reportedly a 1924 edition published in Sydney, was intact with the words Tamam Shud still in place. Boxall was now working in the maintenance section at the Randwick bus depot where he worked before the war and was unaware of any link between the dead man and himself. In the front of the copy of Rubiat that was given to Boxall, Jessica Harkness had signed herself Jestin and written out verse 70. Indeed, indeed, repentance oft before. I swore, but I was sober when I swore. And then, and then came spring, and rose in hand. My threadbare penitence a piece is tore. As one journalist wrote in June 1949, alluding to the line in Rubiat, the Somerton man seems to have made certain that the glass would be empty, save for speculation and noted that if he died by poison so rare and obscure it could not be identified by toxicology experts, then surely the culprit's advanced knowledge of toxic substances pointed to something more serious than a domestic poisoning. A number of possible identifications have been proposed over the years, but all have been investigated and ruled out. In 1949, the body of the unknown man was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery where the Salvation Army conducted the service. The South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association paid for the service to save the man from a pauper's burial. The Somerton Man case is one that's always fascinated me. It is quite long and involved, so I've condensed it to bring you the main details. So at the beginning of next week's video, I shall be bringing you developments in the case and a possible identification. Once again, thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like, share the video and leave a comment. Until next week, stay lucky, stay happy, stay safe and most of all, stay spooky.
Thank <laughs> you.